Hey there, Rob. How you doing, man? I'm doing great. How are you? You know, I'm doing well. I, I appreciate you popping in here. Um, so because I assume most of my listeners have, uh, quite frankly, never heard of you. Can you just give us a quick little about you kind of thing? Sure. My name is Rob Scott. I'm an attorney in the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex. Um, I, um, work in a law firm called Scott and Scott LLP, which is a technology law firm focused on IT services and software. And, uh, I've been doing that since, uh, 1999. Prior to that, I went to law school at Hofstra University School of Law in New York. And, uh, prior to that, I went to the, uh, undergraduate school at Austin college in Sherman. I graduated high school in 1989 from Richardson high school here in the DFW Metroplex. Cool. So, uh, 99, you've been doing this for a little bit. Uh, I, would you, would you say you're like at law? That, that's a I tricky say, one, right? I would say that my expertise in law is focused on computer law. There you go. And so our firm focuses our practice on areas where, um, computer technology and legal matters intersect and, uh, given, uh, what's happened over the years, those intersections have increased with regulatory, uh, uh, privacy and security, as well as the growth and, and adoption of, uh, IT managed services and, and cloud solutions. Um, our business is, is, um, you know, you focus on computer law and computer changes, computers and technology change rapidly. And you're constantly trying to, you know, keep pace from a legal perspective, which always kind of trails the technology. Gotcha. Well, okay. So let's, let's talk about some computer stuff. Cause, uh, well, that's what everyone here listens for. Right. So you guys, uh, like you said, you focus on computer law and one of the, one of the industries that you guys focus on is managed service providers. Uh, so funny meeting. Uh, <laughs> so talk to me about, is there something that you see often when you look at contracts from MSPs and you go, whoa, do you see any red flags are there, and are they common? Yeah, I would say that, you know, when I first started doing managed services contracts over 15 years ago, the question was, do you need a contract at all? And believe it or not, uh, I don't think there's many anymore, but there are still some that are operating on a handshake and with no contracts, which is a scary proposition. Um, more uh, recently, what I see is people who go out and get a, a, a form off the internet or get a form from a vendor they're working with and without fully understanding the implications of, of the contracts that they're adopting within their business, they'll run with those agreements. And, and what I see in general among MSPs is they're not doing an adequate job with their contracts of mitigating their risk in the event of something going wrong in particular related to third-party service providers, such as RMM providers, the, the Kaseya incidents of last summer come to mind as an example of this risk, as well as the criminal acts of third parties, not involving third-party services, but could be um, um, other uh, criminal acts, malicious attacks, hackers, uh, even criminals within the employment, uh, you know, of the end user customer. So what I have generally seen is MSP contracts don't do an adequate job of, of disclosing who the third party service providers are and therefore aren't adequately waiving the, the rights to sue the MSP for those failures, as well as not going into adequate detail around who's responsible for the criminal acts of third parties. And then finally not following the regulatory requirements in terms of having the appropriate data processing terms in place for end user customers, for example, that are in healthcare or in financial services or may um, operate in a state where there's a data protection law or um, maybe less frequently are operating um, in international um, 
uh, business where EU uh, laws such as GDPR uh, might apply. And so I think those are the three areas when I see contracts uh, that I see um, the most opportunity for improvement and the most opportunity for risk mitigation. Okay. I I like that you say that contracts, it, it sounds like, you know, one of the biggest things that you're a proponent for is risk mitigation. Um, okay. So let's, let's talk about, uh, risk mitigation for a second. How, how do MSPs with today's cybersecurity landscape, how do we mitigate risk? How, how can we say, all right, look, I know that you've hired me to, to basically be like your IT department, but you know, I'm, I'm not an insurance company. And if something goes wrong, you know, I, I'm, I'm not the, the bank of IT get to just come and, and withdraw with whatever amount you want. Yes. And then more importantly, how do we, a lot of MSPs that like, we all rely on third-party tools for practically everything. Right. Mm -hmm. So how do we, how do we go to these companies and say, uh, well, Hey, look, um, we don't actually do anything ourselves. We, we rely on all these third-party products to do it for us. Uh, so because of that, we can't be held liable for anything they screw up. I, I think there's, I think there's a couple of answers to your questions and there's no single silver bullet on risk mitigation, but there are certain pillars that I think are very important. Uh, number one is insurance, cyber liability insurance, both for the MSP and the end user customer, our agreements that we provide to our clients specify that the MSP will have tech ENO, including cyber, but importantly also require the end user customer to carry a cyber liability insurance for first party claims. Hey, good. I think, I think both of those are critically important beyond that. It's incredibly important to have customer contracts that make it clear where the MSP's responsibilities start and where they end. And our agreements have got numerous, numerous provisions in them that address um, circumstances under which the MSP will not be responsible. Uh, last fall, I created in response to the Kaseya incident something called the schedule of third party service providers. And what that is, is a table of all of the uh, tools that an MSP may use a link to the uh, vendors end user terms and conditions or applicable terms, as well as a link to their privacy policy. And in bold letters, it says that under no circumstances will the customer sue the MSP for any act or failure of a third party service. And I'm sure, and, I'm sure it states that much more eloquently with legal ease, right? Oh, sure. I mean, it, 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 it's a very direct, but it is direct in language. Okay. Um, and it's in legal ease, but, but the point of the matter is, is that prior to the Kaseya incident, I had in my contracts, a, just a, bl a blanket statement that says. Customer understands that MSP uses third parties to deliver some or all of the services and that the MSP is not responsible for failures of third party services. I didn't think in response to Kaseya that that would be adequate, that what we needed was something of a greater level of disclosure uh, and a clearer and un more unequivocal waiver of the right to sue. And that's why we developed this third party service provider schedule. So. Um, but, but, but third party risks are a big one. Criminal acts of third party, another one, lost data, another one, all of these things need to be taken into consideration in the risk balancing provisions of the agreement, which include the indemnity, the limitation of liability and the insurance provisions. And in our agreements, all those work together to put the, put the MSP in the lowest possible risk that it can by, by doing exactly what you said, taking the MSP out of being in the insurance business 
and using uh, insurance both for the MSP and the end user customer for that purpose and put the MSP only on the hook for the things that are actually it's a result of its negligent acts or failures to act and then and only then subject to a cap and then and only then subject to many exclusions. Because in the end, for an MSP to make any money, risk mitigation has to be primary. If you think about the managed services and, and you think about it as a business model, you, you got other people taking the lion's share of the revenue and putting the vast majority of the um, risk on the MSP. If the MSP doesn't do a good job of transferring that risk to an insurance company and mitigating it within its customer contracts, then it's not doing a good job. And I, I'm going to say finally, not because it's the last pillar, but because I'm getting to it last, good security practices mitigate risk. Don't dabble in managed services. And don't believe that if you're in managed services, you're not in security because we're all in security. And you have to set it up in a way that you've got the right solutions in place to avoid, wherever possible, security incidents. Mm -hmm. So that's the first and primary defense. You know, a lot of people had Kaseya, but had other solutions in place that detected the problem before it became a problem and were able to mitigate it such that there was no incident for their customers. It's that type of security that is the best risk mitigation you can have. But the reality is accidents happen and there's a lot of bad people in the world. And that's why you need these other risk mitigation strategies, including insurance and great customer contracts. That, that's a really good point. Um, so, so I'm going to, I'm going to pivot a little bit. When I, I speak to, I'll call them larger MSPs. I'm, I'm starting to hear of them uh, do things the way that a lot of our vendors are doing where, you know, you, you fill out the, the contract online, right? And it's more like the check the box. If you agree to our terms and the terms, you click the link and then there's their, their contract, right? So some, many MSPs call it the MSA, the master services agreement. And that's because something that became commonplace over the last, oh gosh, five or so years, I want to say, is we've got one master agreement and then we've got a separate statement of work. And the statement of work is basically, here's, here's what we're going to charge you, what we're going to do. And then the, the master services agreement is, um, basically just the terms of, of our arrangement, uh, what it's, what it's dictating to, uh, I'm sorry, it is dictating what it is like to do business to, would you, would you say that's accurate? First of all, I would say that's standard and that's consistent with the way our approach is. We have, uh, uh and, and now moved because of this move to online contracting, we now have a hosted solution for our customer contracts mm. and it is set up the way you describe it's, it, 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 what, what we do is we have now tried to collapse the sales process and the contracting process into one step by leveraging the online approach that you've described. So what we're doing now is we are having our customers, um, follow their sales process with a quote or a proposal or an order form. And then we give them legal language to incorporate by reference, the online terms and conditions that you mentioned, including the master services agreement, as well as all of the service attachments for any recurring revenue services that the MSP may use. And as is typical in the industry and in our approach, those include a, a managed IT, which would be your core managed services, mm -hmm. managed security services, which would be sort of advanced cyber or optional security services would be covered there. Backup and disaster recovery, cloud and hosting, vo uh, managed voice over IP. We also have um, surveillance and access control. Um, any, any type of service that's typical in the industry, we've got a service attachment that can be bolted on for purposes of running with that MSA. 
And in addition to that, we built in the third-party service providers document, the data processing terms, which would be the business associate agreement or the uh, any regula- regulation required agreements, as well as the um, service level objectives, all contained on hyperlinks to our system, all attached as an exhibit to any quote or a proposal that our clients are having their end user customers sign. Hey. So very similar to what you've described. We're trying to bring what you describe as enterprise class contracting solutions to the SMB. I got to say, I, f- I feel like more and more companies are finding ways to take a traditional uh, like one and done type of transaction and turn it into monthly recurring revenue. Because I assume when, when you say you've got a hosted solution with agreement and all the, all the bells and whistles, now, now this is becoming a, a monthly recurring revenue situation for you, which means now, uh, the MSPs are going to possibly feel like, so what's what's the how do, how do i phrase this what why would an msp want to sign up with a service like yours versus just paying whoever you know one of the other contract guys that specialize in msps to just like make them an msa yeah and that's a great question cuz i was that guy for 15 years until january mm. <laughs> and that's the way I delivered my services to hundreds of MSPs. And what I learned was that in particular, uh, they don't do a great job of managing the contracts themselves because they don't understand them. They get in the hands of salespeople. They change them in ways that don't really protect the company. Um, regulations come out and they're not updated for that. Um, uh, so, so what I've learned is that uh, MSPs, contracts need to be looked at, touched and, and updated way more frequently than they used to be. You know, if, if uh, someone came to me and I did their customer contracts in 2015, they might not need to come back to me until 2018, 2019. And it was not a big deal. Now we're changing these agreements every day and every quarter people who are on our system get an update to the latest and greatest versions of all of the documents, yes. the scheduled third-party services, for example, if you drop a vendor and add a new one that needs to be added we do that every quarter um your data processing terms you know there's state laws coming out all the time there's international laws that could affect you there's federal regulations that are on the horizon and when you sign up with us we cover all that and we update your data processing terms when those laws come out um and so the idea of having A one and done really, in my mind, doesn't meet the needs of what the managed service provider has. And and really what they need is a partner in a lawyer or law firm that can help them manage the legal side of the transactions without interfering with their sales process. And so that's what we've tried to develop, which is a solution that gives the MSP complete control over the commercial terms, but essentially locks the terms and conditions And so they're not going to get changed unless we have intervention because we include a review of any end user customer changes in our monthly fee. Okay. Um, so, so, so those are the reasons I think why the one and done doesn't make sense. But in order to mitigate that concern, uh, we offer, uh, uh, options where the client can have a, a, a perpetual license to our forms with no need to continue to pay for maintenance and support. That's nice. So, okay. so maintenance and support is an optional thing. If you get into it and you, you're a year in and you think, man, these updates every quarter are more than I need and I'm really not actively pursuing new customers and so I can run with what I got for a while and I don't want to pay a maintenance and support fee, it's optional. Okay. And you have a perpetual license to the document. So I don't I, – I, I, I don't – while I, I think it's important for MSPs to have an ongoing service, we've structured it in a way that it's not required. They, they can run with a perpetual license to our then existing forms and not be, uh, feel bound to maintenance and support. And, and I just want to clarify, I don't want 
people to like put you in the same bucket, if you will, as companies like legal zoom or, or those where, where it's like, you know, 20, $30 a month and they handle all your legal for you. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like yours is a, it's going to be much more customized and tailored to each MSP while you, while you've got, um, clauses that work in maybe all the states. And then, you know, what clauses work in my particular state, I may say to you something along the lines of, um, we're going to use Adobe's, uh, signature tools. So make sure that the, the contract has whatever clause in there for electronic signatures, e-signatures, whatever the appropriate term is, uh, we may, we may say, Hey, can you put something in there where, uh, clients can't, you know, treat us like crap and curse us out over the phone and throw things at us when we're there? Like, can we, can we have an out if a client's abusive? Like you'll, you'll help us with that stuff, right? That's all, all of those things are already there. So what I would do in that situation is I would point you to the applicable language, Steve that covers the concern. And then if it wasn't there, we would do a custom pro provision to address that concern. And all that customization is part of our service. It, it, it's, uh, we do an initial customization in the first 30 days, and then we do ongoing customization every quarter. Okay. So this is a situation where I built the solution so that you can have your own customized version of our master template, and I can update your version every quarter because my software is aware of your customizations. They don't get overwritten. I'm going to, I'm focusing on keeping your customizations while updating the legal terms and conditions every quarter and showing you a report and giving you the opportunity to approve any of those updates before we go live with them. That's awesome. So what, what do services like this usually start at? Uh, we have a variety of different options from, you know, the perpetual pay up front with very limited, you know, obligations in the future, all the way down to, um, you know, pay as little as possible up front and pay a small monthly fee for a longer time commitment. Okay. But I would say that whether you're paying it out over a three year period or you're paying it up front, the cost is between 10 and $12,000 total. Okay. Uh, over that three, uh, over that period. Um, and does that, so for example, I'm so sorry, does that include the, the maintenance stuff that you guys do as well? Correct. Awesome. Correct. Correct. So, so in, in the perpetual plus maintenance model, uh, typical packages are 10,000 upfront, 2,200 a year for maintenance and support. Um, and then in the subscription, you know, model, uh, we're running, um, uh, as low as 300 for setup and 300 a month for 36 months. Um, and ultimately that's going to be where I want the pricing to land. I want it. I want the solution to be available to every MSP that's doing any kind of significant business. And I think at that price point, we should be able to capture 10% or more of the market, which is my long-term goal. Mm -hmm is to have this solution uh, being used by 10% or more of MSPs. And I believe that in order to do that, we have to make it very affordable. Mm -hmm. And so I've been working extremely hard with my team to reevaluate the way we deliver the services, to think more like a SaaS provider and less like a law firm. And um, we're on that journey to, to, to bring scalability and bring the cost down, both through changes in process, as well as adoption of technology that allows us to deliver the services much more efficiently. And let's say after the 36 months, we're, you know, let's just assume we're still happy. You know, you've, we've, we've paid for it. We've, we've done the maintenance and, you know, laws are going to continue changing after three years. Is there like a continual maintenance after that available? Yeah. So, so at that point you'd have, um, at that point you'd have a perpetual license to all the forms and then your monthly fee would be more around 
12 months, you know, 12 monthly payments, similar to what we would charge on maintenance and support to the perpetual, um, uh, the license plus support people. So figure, um, instead of paying two ninety nine a month, assuming that the maintenance and support was still 2200, it would be, you know, under 200 a month. Okay. So I gotta say, um, for, for MSPs of I'll say most sizes. Okay. Cause you know, there are the little guys who maybe they only have a couple thousand in MRR right now. So, but for, for MSPs of most sizes, um, you know, paying a few hundred bucks as a, as a setup fee, that, that seems completely reasonable because you are customizing this agreement for each MSP that comes on board. Okay. And then, and then paying a few hundred bucks a month for, for the three years. Now, now we own it after that we're done. And we didn't have to shell out 10, 12, 10, $12,000 up front. Um, yeah. And then, and then ongoing maintenance. I mean, that, that all seems fair, man. It it really does for you to, for you to, I, I, I've engineered it to, be, I've engineered, this is one of these things where we've got a service that's chasing a price point. In yeah. other words, in managed services, you know, my experience with it, which is vast, I've been in it for 15 years. I've been on the board of the MSP Alliance and the general counsel of that group for 14 years. Uh, I've been around managed services for a while and, and I understand that, you know, most MSPs are small businesses for whom $10,000 is a lot of money. It's not just laying around. Now I've got some MSPs that are 50 million plus a year, 10 grand, 12 grand is nothing to them. Mm -hmm. Um, but for the bulk of the market, I have to deliver a solution that delivers a great deal of value for a very low price. Correct. And that's what this service is designed to do. And so let's, I want to ask more rapid fire questions, if you will. Okay. Um, so what happens if somebody signs up and for some reason they're not? Um, has we fix whatever it is that they, <laughs> whatever it is. I, I mean, I just don't know. I'm happy is a, is sort of a loose term. I mean, we, we haven't had that experience. Okay. Um, we've got 47 customers that are live on the system since uh, January, all MSPs, uh, at, at some point or another, they've expressed, you know, a desire for us to change their agreements or they didn't like particular language that might have been in the forms. Uh, but nobody's been unhappy with our service. Nobody's been unhappy with, um, our solution. Okay. Um, and, and so what I would say is it would depend on the circumstances, but we would make it right. I mean, we're, we're here to take care of our clients and, and to make sure that they're taken care of well. And one of the things about our law firm is we have a very, very high um, uh, customer satisfaction scores across the board. And that's part of our culture to make sure that if a customer is unhappy, we confront it. We don't run from it. We get in front of it and address it. So, um, but, but if it turned out that it, it was something different than what they expected or somehow they, you know, decided they don't want it, we would work it out with them. We, I, you know, we're building this service to, to help MSPs not to hurt them. So if it, turned out to be something that an MSP was not happy with, we would make it right, whatever it took. Well, hey, I got to say, um, I haven't seen what the platform looks like. Do you have like a demo or something that you can walk people through before they sign Absolutely. up? That's great. Absolutely. Absolutely. I have a demo and uh, I can show, I can demonstrate both how our integrations work with the leading platforms such as ConnectWise Cell, which many of our clients are using our rapid um, uh, implementation using CAN templates that we've developed for ConnectWise Cell that integrate with our solution. Uh, so I can demonstrate that. We've integrated with many other tools, including Quoter. We offer uh, out-of-the-box um, orders for Microsoft Word. But this is a, this is a platform agnostic solution and, and I can demonstrate it to clients, uh, how it works as well as demonstrate the actual documents themselves. If they have questions like you had earlier, what if this happens or what if they cancel for convenience or 
Am I protected in this situation? Or what are my rights to cancel if they're abusive to my people? I show the customers before they sign up all the provisions that address the, the areas of their concern. That's great. Red, thanks so much for popping on here, man. Um, I really appreciate it. Uh, for people that want to check you out, where can they go? What website? So the website is um, Scott and Scott LLP.com. Uh, you could do a Google search for Scott and Scott LLP and find it. Um, you can also reach me at 214 999 0080 is my office number. And you can email me at rjscott at scottandscottllp.com and set up a demo. Excellent. Well, there you have it, folks. Thanks so much, Scott. Thank you, Steve.